Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Plowline Podcast. This is going to be the first episode of the Plowline Podcast that is recorded on video. Uh, so we appreciate you being here. And I am your host, uh, Jeremy Tunnell, with my co-host, Dr. Jerry E. Balarosa Tunnell. I'm very proud to introduce her with that new title. Jerry? Yes, thank you, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking with Kara Wood and Erin Sweeney, who I am just so I am so excited to be talking to these two amazing queens. But before we get started, uh, one of the first things that I like to do is to honor the land in which our feet stand. And I will begin by acknowledging that those of us who are gathering in the Seattle, Washington area north, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people who have lived in the Salem Sea Basin since time immemorial. We respect this place and honor the sacred spiritual connection to the land, water, and its people, past, present, and future. And by acknowledging these lands and their original indigenous inhabitants, we reach back to our own indigenous roots and reflect on the impacts of colonialism and the lands from which all our people come. We are connected to our ancestors through this connection to land, for the land is what connects us all. It is also critical to acknowledge that this country would not exist if it wasn't for the free enslaved labor of black people and the contribution of the Chinese railroad workers in helping complete the most important construction project in the mid 19th century America. And to add to the mix of acknowledgement that our country has failed to do, I'd like to honor the Filipino Manongs who played a significant role in building the farm workers movement in the 1920s and 30s organizing and striking alongside Mexican immigrants, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Herta. It is also critical for us to honor the legacy of the African, Asian, indigenous and native diaspora and the knowledge to care for these lands and the skills to build the America we all share today. So please join me in taking a moment to honor the land of the traditional people in the territory in which you stand and today we honor the Tulalip tribes and allied bands for the enduring care and protection of this land. And I also honor the life and labor of the black, Asian, native and indigenous communities by expressing my deepest respect and gratitude. So thank you so much, Erin and Kara for being here with us today. Jeremy, you wanna start us off? Yeah, um, let's, do, let's do their bios real quick. Do you have them? I'll, I'll read them. I be, read. Yeah, because you got them out. <laughs> so Carol Wood was made in Mexico, born in New Mexico and raised in California by a first generation Southern Italian American single mother who instilled in her early on, music and books are important and we are abolitionists. Cara means in Turkish beloved or dear one in Italian and in Irish friend. She currently lives on the occupied territory of the Chochenyo Ohlone people, also known as Oakland, California. Virgus, Virgil Sun, Cancer Moon, Sagittarius Rising. She is an animist folk herbalist who help folk deepen and activate the ancestral connection inside their bodies. Her ancestors were Mediterranean on her mother's side and English, German, Scottish, and Irish on her father's side. Her first ancestors landed on Turtle Island in the 1620s and, and the last her mother's father arrived as a teenager from Calabria in the 1920s. Carr believes we are ancestors, that we hold the ancestor realm inside of our bodies. She believes the elements, the plants, trees and mushrooms are our ancestors. She believes it all comes down to energy exchange. This guide her as she walks through the world epigenetics, mythology, and living folk culture direct and inform her work. She's committed to collective liberation, reparations, and rematriation, shifting culture away from white supremacy, away from injustice and intolerance. She meets her shadow daily, and she lives in the ancestral process spiral. Kara is in devotion to and in communication with her ancestors and attempts to live as the ancestors that she wants to be. Welcome, Kara. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I need to breathe that in. That's beautiful. Erin, mm -hmm. Caitlin Sweeney, she, they, is a politicized healer, educator, and group facilitator. 
their people come from what's called now called Scotland, Ireland, France, and Germany. And she humbly resides on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock and Lenni Lenape peoples, who is currently known as Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Erin offers one-to-one -one ancestral healing and remembrance work for folks of European descent, AKA white folks, with an anti-racist and decolonial lens, as well as workshops and classes. Erin loves to dance, tend to her plants and tell stories. They're passionate about the intersection of healing and social justice and believes that when we look inward with accountability, honesty and compassion, we can bring healing to ourselves, our ancestors and show up rooted for collective liberation. And we will definitely share the uh, websites on how you can get a hold of both Erin and Kara at the end. So thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Wow. Yeah. We are so connected. Like I feel <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful. So yes, when, when Jeremy and I first started um, this work, it was, it was, it was difficult because it's not like we just kind of like woke up one day and it's like, well, here we are, right? This is what we're gonna do. The um the trials that we had to get here to um, get us to this point where we needed to unpack a lot of the shit that we've had inside of ourselves and be able to kind of like put it on the table and look at it and mm -hmm. not in just one direction, but in all directions and ask questions about how, how do we get past this? And I think both Jeremy and I realized that it begins with ourself first. It begins from within. Jeremy, what's your favorite quote from Krishnamurti? I think it's the foundational quote for the work we do. Um, the only hope for humankind is the transformation of the individual. And I think that sums it up. If we're, you know, we can change policy, we can change procedure, we can change presidents, we can change, we can change all these things, we can change systems. But the reality is, is that true change is not going to happen until individuals change, until they begin to see a new world beyond this world. What's a world look like without money? What's a world look like without fossil fuels? What's a world look like, you know, what's a world look like when humanity is living harmoniously? And I think, I think in order to get there, we have to like start with our selves first, right? And, you know, I think I would like to um, invite Aaron and Kara in to just kind of like, you know, let us know on how did you get here? How did you get to this place <laughs> where you are right now? <laughs> Kara, you want to start? Yeah, sure. And just when you say we're all connected, um, my belief is the ancestors are the great orchestrators. So, <clears throat> you know, this, um, this is a tapestry that was woven. We are a tapestry together woven by them. And so how did I get here? Um, I have always, like I said in my bio, always lived in the ancestor realm. Um, I believe really that we all do, but I've just always been very aware of it and very connected with it. Um, because um, I have a, my father died when I was really little. And so I was in connection with him, communication with my dad. And I knew that he was still there, um, even though he wasn't in this tangible uh, realm. He wasn't in the material realm anymore but he was still there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's a big part of where, where this comes from within myself. But um, I've just always felt my ancestors. I felt my grandmother's really strong in my <laughs> life, you know? Um, and just throughout my life, I've just really been very um, curious about other people's ancestry too, you know, like what were your, what, who are your ancestors like? And I was like, no other kids were really talking about that. Um, <laughs> it was around, but and then, you know, as I, uh, I was an artist, I am an artist, I, st I studied art. Um, and now as an herbalist, what's brought me here is that it, it is all connected. It all is part of our process as human beings, you know, like our healing is individual, is, our collective healing is individual, like you're saying, Jeremy. And so, um, being an herbalist working with plants, um, that's 
another way of working with our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Our plants are our ancestors. So yeah. just briefly, you know, to, to begin, that's kind of what's brought me here is like all these little pieces, what I care about, um, have met in this place where I can finally say, okay, this is really, this is what I want to offer to the world. Um, as, as my offering is um, my absolute presence in healing and in that way is to to weave all these pieces together. Yep. yep. I want to just take a really quick moment to look at the light around us. Like, Kara, I can see the light coming in just to the side. And Aaron, mm -hmm. look at the light behind you. It's just, it's just beautiful. Jeremy, look at the shadow, right? And the light right above your head. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the ring light <laughs> but that that's the sun yeah, yeah. Okay. just wanted yeah. just wanted to bring that in it's just like ancestors is like mm -hmm. this is this is mm -hmm. this is us together so i i have a feeling that someone's gonna like pop into this podcast and they're gonna like hear me talking about all of this stuff they'll be like what the <laughs> what are these people Did you smoke about? weed before the podcast <laughs> right maybe <laughs> i love it <laughs> anyway <laughs> i just needed to bring the light in that's all yeah i love the idea of um of plants being our ancestors um jerry and i were in, introduced to um to um herbalism uh by a teacher out of our whole systems design program that we stayed connected with um named victoria holt and um, who we really need to have on this podcast. And um, she, um, she continued to teach Jerry and I for some time. Uh, Jerry really, um, you know, well, no, I guess we both did in our own way. You know, um, we, we learned to go in, um, and be where to pick roots and, and uh, where to gather and, and then how to distill and, and how to make tinctures. And so we have, um, you know, in our kitchen, you know, we've got two big, um, um, you know, open shelving units with dishes and whatnot, but the top shelf of both of these is nothing but an apothecary, you know, like it's just, it, and, you know, it's, and some of it's not labeled, you know, so you're like, <laughs> oh, girl, what's this do? Uh, <laughs> you know, Taste and this. so, yeah, uh, but it, it, it um, I think for myself, I always felt a connection to, especially trees, I always felt a, a connection to this idea that they're, you know, that, um, you know, they're, they're not a human consciousness, but they are a consciousness. They're a sentient being. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the idea that, um, that uh, the plants are our ancestors brings us back to this idea that, that um, they're our ancestors because we're an integral part of nature, not separate from nature. Mm -hmm. Aaron, what brought you here? How'd you get mm. here? <laughs> so good, so rich already. There's so many things I wanna say, but I'll answer your question. Um, first, I just wanna give a, like a shout out to Kara's bio. Like that was the <laughs> best, most like inspiring bio I've ever That's heard. And now I'm like, I really need to update mine. Um, a good one, that's funny. I had the same thought when I read it. I was like, mm -hmm. wow, thanks. That was hard. That's not easy for me. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> just like props. Props to you. Um, how did I get here? I think the short version of that story, well, I think one really core piece is that, and I only understand this now, like I can only see it now with perspective, but um, my mom was and is the keeper of my family's stories. She has boxes and boxes of photographs. She has a memory that is just like unmatchable in terms of the names and the stories and the places. And I grew up on land where I just recently moved back to after 16 years away of land where my Pennsylvania Dutch German ancestors lived for centuries. And so I grew up with a con with an understand an ancestral understanding that we're Pennsylvania Dutch, we're Pennsylvania German. I grew up in an area that like a lot of people you go, I go to the cemetery to visit my ancestors. And it's just like, 
all the names on the headstones are like names of people I went to high school with. Um, so, and so I grew up with those sort of traditions, um, and that knowing, and then on my dad's side, there are Irish Catholics from Boston. So like strong cultural identity, right. And like pride within that. And within both of those stories, there are a lot of complexities, but I grew up with that sort of understanding. Okay. Like I'm Irish and I'm German. I'm, I, come to learn that I'm more than that, but that was sort of my knowing. My name, Erin Caitlin Sweeney, like very, very, very Irish, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I kind of had that root. I grew up amidst the, in this tiny village that's just tree with trees. Like I grew up with deep knowing of the trees, deep relationship with the trees, with the squirrels. And, but then later on, right? Um, Later on in my life, in my 20s, I was more, you know, I, I've experienced depression for a lot of a lot of my life and was kind of in this deeper inquiry and spiritual inquiry or like, okay, well, how do I tend to this wounding in a way that's um, not through Western medicine, which is the way that I had approached it and kind of sitting in these deeper inquiries and feeling, you know, this kind of spiritual void, this unknowing, this disconnection, um, which eventually led me um, to studying integrative health um, at the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is where I met my two teachers. And so the, my first semester there was with um, a top, I took a class with the Tava Garcia Soiziki, who is um, a wonderful human being that Cara and I both um, get to call a teacher. It was an indigenous medicine class. And she really was like, what is your indigenous medicine? Like everyone in the class, like who, like, really holding that we all have ancestors who live in deep relationship with the earth. And so she was really the first person to connect me, to introduce me to my ancestors in that way, right? Like I had a pretty strong foundation, but she was really like, it's like really understanding like, no, they're with us all the time, <laughs> right? Like that there's deep medicine there, there's deep knowing there. And, um, and then through continuing, um, really feeling called to deepen into this work, I was able to study with a program outside of the one I was in with um, Kimmy Johnson, um, who turns out was one of Atava's teachers and both of them studied with um, a woman named Apila Colorado. And so like these, again, like how, what, what Cara was speaking to, like how the ancestors are just like leading the way always and how there's just like, these deep synchronicities. And, um, and so with Kimmy, I was able to really, really deepen into like these, these inquiries, these inquiries, this, this medicine. And, and then with Atava, I got to intern and work with Atava and learn about plants and just have been fortunate enough to have them both um, in my life over the years um, as guides and teachers and friends. And so, and so that is, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. Um, but I, I will, I'll say one last thing of really of where I am now and like of really sitting with the impact of, of living on, on, on land where my, my people are buried and where they lived and feeling like a huge, huge difference mm. um, from when I was living in, in California when mm -hmm. where beautiful magical place and my ancestors led I was led there for very clear reasons but I don't have people out there that I know of um at least I've got lots of people out there but not mm -hmm. blood connections that I know of um so I'll stop there that's beautiful I mean, you know, I mean, it's like whenever I think about the uh, a, a lot of a lot of the work that Jeremy and I have done, especially I mean, in my research was around this ancestral connection and not really understanding about my ancestral connection until I had to actually go through the process of decolonization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't even really know what decolonization was until I was questioned about my identity. I think I think it was the first time when I had to fill out my name and, and people asked, how do you identify? Do you Hispanic, Pacific Islander? You know, what is it? And I was like, what does this mean? What does this mean? In Hawaii, we never talked about ethnicity. We talked about nationality. 
Mm. It was like, what was our nationality? I didn't know what ethnicity was until later on in life. And then I was like, wow, we really have to put ourselves into these boxes. And then putting ourselves into these boxes, we're socialized into thinking that we are separate and we're different from each other and that we have no other connection except to what exists within this box. And I was, I, I was one that always wanted to break down the boxes. I'm not a, I, I don't like to keep boundaries, right? <laughs> Sometimes I question the boundaries. It's like, why the hell is this here? It doesn't make any sense. My friend lives on the other side. How can I get there, right? So it's like, I've always questioned, I've always questioned boundaries, but I, I never, you know, it's like I assimilated into a culture that was not my own. And I had to, as I started to unpack and decolonize, I realized that as I was assimilating into this culture for survival, mm -hmm. I was causing a lot of harm to my own people where I would um, think that I was better than them. I would, when I would go to Hawaii, I would talk over them. And because it's like, I left the islands and I, you know, got my degrees and all of these things, things that I never had access to, or didn't know how to have access to it. You know, it's like when I first started to talk about going to college and I asked my dad and my mom, I'm like, I need to fill out the FAFSA. And my dad was like, who's FAFSA, right? He didn't even know, right? So being first generation higher ed was like, I thought, in my head, I thought, yeah, this makes me better than my people. But then realizing after unpacking a lot of things that there's a responsibility in what I'm doing. The letters behind my name wasn't to, wasn't to hold me up. It was to open the doors for the next generation, just like what my ancestors did for me, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, so it's building these shoulders so the next generation could kind of like come about. But in the mm -hmm. five phases of decolonization that Elder uh, Pokala Inui from Hawaii, who is an attorney and also an activist, the majority of my work is based on that. And so the first, the, the first phase of decolonization, and it's not linear, right? It could, it could, it could kind of show up everywhere, is rediscovery and recovery, mm -hmm. and then mourning, and then dreaming, and then commitment, and then action. And then in those processes, as you're, as you're stepping into one phase to the next, the nuances and the complexities that come up from all of that is like, holy shit, <laughs> rediscovering and recovering, you know, going back and looking at the, um, you know, what happened in the Philippines, you know, being the colonizer and being the colonized, and then looking back and discovering things that I didn't know things that sometimes I wish I can see why we would never know and how the stories has changed and shifted to protect individuals. You know, it's like we talk about how King Kamehameha united the islands, but what we don't talk about is that he actually had Western power to help overtake his own people. And I'm like, oh my gosh, do I share this story? And then I'm sitting with it like, I have the opportunity to write my dissertation and share the story, but do I share it? Do I share the story that was not shared to me and why was it not shared to me? Mm -hmm. Why, who am I protecting and do I continue to protect them? Or do I open it up so the wounds can be healed? I didn't know how to handle that in that moment. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, do I sit with protecting everything that has been done? Or do I know that if I start speaking about this, we can actually breathe healing, right? It's like that ha, it's opening it up to the air to allow healing to occur. But then within that healing, the other traumas that will also mm -hmm. appear and reappear. And then how do I hold space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm for all of that to happen. Yeah. And that's a big responsibility. So yeah, the journey of decolonization is a journey of, of being willing to uncover trauma, deal with that trauma, expect that you're going to deal with it again, and then uncover the next trauma. Yeah, because we're dealing with generational harm. Yeah. Kara? Oh, I was just gonna say it's like a threshold. It's just constant threshold that we're at 
you know, and each time if, and it's spiral, it's described mm. as a spiral a lot. Right. And I also feel like it's threshold. It's like, everything is kind of this threshold where we, we choose to go through it and see what's going to happen once we move through, or are we going to stay back? Like Jerry describing, just like, what do you do in that situation? How do you, how do you move forward and moving through that threshold? It's that's bravery. Like it's, this, this is not for the faint at heart or mind, you know, like we, we it's, it takes a lot yeah. to do this work. Erin? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's so, thank you for sharing. Like there are so many pieces of that, just that of what you shared about your story and your, and your own experience that really, that really hit me um, to my core. So thank you for, for sharing that with us today. Um, I think there are a lot of things that I could say, but what I what feels important to say right now um, is like is a recognizing um, the challenges of this work of like really like yeah like unpacking like generations of of silence right of how many like that's a like an inquiry that I hold a lot around um, stories and storytelling and ancestral stories and family stories. It's like of, okay, well, what are the stories that continue to get passed down and like, what purpose are they serving, right? And you can see that with our collective stories, right? In this, in this country, right? The stories that we, most of us were taught in school, right? Around Mayflower and all, and all the things, right? Um, but then with our family stories too, like oftentimes are the stories that, um, that want to, uphold a particular narrative, right? And there's, oh, there's usually good reasons for that, right? But then how do we hold this inquiry? And how do we, how do, we do this work in community? Because it is so hard, because it is so much and it is so hard, right? And so I think as I'm like, as I was just kind of like sitting with the, the, the visual story that you kind of created for us, Cara, with these thresholds that we're continuing to walk through and the sort of spiral. And it's like, okay, and it's like, and knowing that we don't have to do this alone, right? And I say that in terms of like, who are our people, right? Who are our community of people that can support us through this? And also like, we have ancestral support through this. Like we have yeah. ancestors who are leading us through this process, right? We have ancestors and that can be really hard for, um, for myself as a white person and for white folks to grasp that we have ancestors who want to help us in this process, yes. right? Who want to help us like disentangle ourselves from right white supremacy and settler colonialism, like who want to liberate us from these systems, right? Who want to help us repair the harm that they cause and that we've continued to perpetuate. And so I think that's like this really important piece to just like knowing all of this and knowing um, that this work is painful, it's beautiful, it's everything, it's everything, <laughs> but that we don't have to do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's the powerful piece to this is, uh, so the Krishnamurti quote, the only hope for humanity or hum humankind is the transformation of the individual. It's the individual's responsibility to, um, to be willing to consciously step into that process of decolonization, rediscover and recover, um, uh, mourning, dreaming, um, uh, commitment, commitment and action. And, but but in that process, it is also the individual's responsibility to create and connect with community because doing it alone is not possible, right? It, it's noble and bold for an individual to be willing to, to okay, I'm going to commit to this. But if you don't connect with community, you can't get it done. Well, and you're just perpetuating the same systems of harm and like the myth of individualism. Exactly. I was just going to say like, that's, that's what we're trying to get. That's the whiteness part is right. that you yes. don't do it in community and that you need to do it on your own. And that's the only, you know, valid way to do it is if you didn't get any help. It's like, no, um, that's where, that's one of the, one of the things I think is that we moved away from that brought us to this place is that mm -hmm. it used to all be collective. And we understood the layers that that means. It's not one way. There's 
<laughs> there's so many ways that mm -hmm. we did this and that we began to disconnect. It didn't happen in one moment. It didn't happen in one generation. No. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, another piece of this is why it's so difficult um, in many ways for all of us is that we all have these in our bodies, we have all of these people in our bodies, all these ancestors, thousands of them, right, <laughs> that are in different places and, and you know, ha affected um, things differently. And so we have to just go, it's like piece by piece. Mm -hmm. And it has to be, it has to be collective. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Mm. And I think it's a, this is a, um, I am like just throwing out all of my dissertation stuff because it, this makes me think of my, this, you know, it's like going through the process of decolonization and utilizing, you know, the theoretical framework of aloha. And so, you know, it's like identifying and defining, I should say, what aloha meant to me in regards to engaging in these conversations and, you know, sharing the breath of life through dialogue. Um, the theoretical framework of aloha is broken down acronymically, A-L-O-H-A. And so as we are going in between and in and out and ebbing and flowing between the uh, five phases of decolonization, we need to ask ourselves and ask each other, right? It's like trying to figure out where where are you in this? How are you doing this, right? Asking questions to inquire and to learn. And then the L is that when you do ask questions, listen. Sometimes mm -hmm. when you ask questions and you stop listening or you ask questions and you don't like what you're hearing, <laughs> then yeah. cognitive yeah. dissonance sets in, you shut down and you no longer listen. But sometimes hearing words that may be triggering to you is to go to the O, the observe, the somatic responses in your body. Right. And the and it's like if you're triggered by what someone is saying, don't ask, why are you triggering me? You need to ask yourself, why am I triggered by this? Right. And then the H is the heart that when we can get to the place of the heart space where we understand that we are much bigger than what is in front of us, we are so much more connected. And, um, you know, I'm a I'm a facilitator in the Institute of Heart Math work and mm -hmm. so it's like that energetic field that connects all of us together in Hawaii we call that mana we call that energy right it's like it's the energy that connects all things and then that moves us to the final a in this framework which is acceptance and adaptability mm -hmm. and when we can come to that place where we can actually accept the fact in ourselves that I don't know everything and what the way I grew up is not the same as that person grew up. And we have different socializations. We can also, we should be able to adapt to the fact that we do come from multiple places with different understandings and different ways of connecting to our ancestors. The way I connect to my ancestors may be different than how other people. The fact of the matter is that we are all connected to our ancestors and we need to be able to hold that space for one another. And, you know, it's like, that can be difficult because when there's not trust, right? It's like, if, if I'm still dealing with all of the traumas of colonization and just looking at that part of myself, that pain, that harm, that trauma, and I look across the room of someone that looks like the colonizer, like with what happened with Jeremy and I, we're never gonna get to that place, right? So it's like, utilizing the framework to get us through the five phases of decolonization, I feel is one way. It's just one way to get us through the place where we need to be. <laughs> Thank you for breaking it down like that. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And all of this came, and, and all of that, and I'm not kidding you, and I keep telling Jeremy that all of the theories that I came up with in my dissertation came through dreams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ancestors. Yeah. Ancestors. And the ancestors were wise enough to, to know, okay, well, we're dealing with a westernized civilization. So let's not just help her with um, breaking down what aloha really means, alo and ha, but let's also help her break it down acronymically because <laughs> man, westernized people love their acronyms. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I think that's one of the other things that that um, I really appreciated about 
um, your initial presentation uh, earlier this year, back in January, um, that that I had a chance to be a part of, was um, you know, um, as I've gone through this process, part of my realization is realizing that um, we're all colonized. We're all colonized, right? We're all the colonizer and the colonized, and colonization is like a virus. Um, you know, it, it turns the colonized into colonizers. And, um, and our ancestors were colonized centuries ago, um, you know, um, uh, in, in the presentations and the work that I do, I, I use um, the, the Gaelic Wars of Julius Caesar as kind of a reference point, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's, not, it's not that linear, but that's a good reference point, right? Like, like Caesar's Gaelic Wars to colonize the European indigenous is a good starting point for um, 2000 years ago for um, the beginning of modern colonization because it wipes out the remnants, it at least starts to wipe out the remnants of um, European um, indigeneity and begins to place over the top of it this generational trauma, this cycle of trauma, right? From, uh, from kingdoms and Christendom and, and, um, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, our process is very much a process of decolonization. Yeah, and I think it's really necessary for, for, um, for, for people who identify as, as white to understand and sit with how, um, our, how we and our ancestors have been harmed within these systems. It's, absolutely necessary for us to understand how we have contributed to and perpetuated these systems. Um, but we, we need to hold that both. And I think when we do, we can actually show up in solidarity in a much more grounded and meaningful way. Like mm -hmm. for example, right? Like, yeah, we can look at Roman imperialism. We can look at the crusades. We can look at the witch burnings. We can, I mean, there are so many like horrific, horrific things, right? And that's what Resma Menachem talks about in his book, My Grandmother's Hands. Like mm -hmm. European folks, like we were doing it to each other before we started doing it to black and brown folks, right? right, right. right? And so, so when I think about that, like I think, right? I think of my Irish ancestors, <laughs> right? Who were, who were colonized by the English, right? And so when I can like root into that, it's like, and see, or my, or my, like, or my Scottish ancestors and the Highland clearances. I mean, there's, there's like the list goes on, the famine, like all the things, right? Um, when I can really like root into those stories and let myself feel them, right? Like remembering that this isn't just like an intellectual process, right? Like it's part of it, but like to let myself really feel. Mm when I read those stories, when I sit with those stories, when I watch films or TV shows depicting those stories, right? Really letting myself feel, I can really understand and see my positionality within these systems and being like, like it may, it's like, of course, it makes sense to be in solidarity with indigenous and black folks. Yes. Because yeah. it's the same fucking system, right. sorry. It's the right. same system. Yeah. That, it is the same fucking system. Yeah. And what is also true is that the Irish came here and made sure that they were higher up on the racial hierarchy than black and brown folks. That's right. And did racist and awful things, right? Like all of that can be true at the same time, but it's so necessary to understand like how this, these systems do not work for anyone. They don't work for anyone. They take our humanity away. And so the more we can root into like our lineages, right? And like our ancestral stories and, and unpack again, like how that lives in our bodies, yes. the more we can yeah. really like repair, heal and show up and continue to show up for the people who are harmed most mm -hmm. by the systems that we're currently in now. Yes. Yeah, well Resma talks about how all of that generational trauma lives in the body of not just BIPOC and all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, um, 
you know, just Aaron, just listening to how you can actually sit with that. A lot of times we, we've learned in a lot of Eurocentric ways is that the body and the mind is separate from mm-hmm. each other, right? It's separate. It's like, <laughs> wow, how can you say that it is separate? It's like, you cannot separate the two. It's not like a piece of the puzzle we can just break up, right? It's it's within us, but being mm-hmm. able to sit with it and, and individuals are, sometimes I feel that it's hard for people. They're afraid to, once they start feeling that in their stomach and they feel that energy just flowing through their body, they stop it, intellectualize it, put it in the bottle, stick it up on the shelf Mm -hmm. to where it's like, I will just pick that up when I feel it's convenient to, but right now I don't want to feel it in my body. That means I got to change. Wait, I got to, you mean, right? That's the touching of our humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to go. And Erin, I love that you dropped the F-bomb like twice or three times. It's like, yes. It's the East Coaster in me. I can't help it. I that is that is um that's that's gracious anger. That is gracious anger. It's it's being angry about the fact that you know what these are the systems that we lived in. These are the systems that we perpetuated. This is how it is. Being angry about all of that, but the grace to know that shit. I've got to be able to meet people where they're at. I need to be able to reach the hearts and individuals of people in order for us to move anything fucking forward. We've got to get into our bodies first. Mm -hmm. And that's the heart space. So yeah. yeah. And sit with the discomfort. Mm -hmm. It's okay to sit with the discomfort. And this is like a major part of it for white folks is like, we've been conditioned our, you know, this is, this is generational in our bodies to, to not sit with the discomfort, to block that in whatever way, to hang up the phone, to walk away, to, you know, clench up our bodies, to do something else, to distract ourselves, to be busy, to, you know, and not just be with that discomfort and all of what it's telling us. Because those messages, Jerry, I think you said this earlier, like what happens in your body? Why are you triggered? Why did that you know, what is that? Like that, these are messages Mm -hmm. (laughs) that tell us where we need to go deeper, you know? And like, for some of us, it's easy to keep going deeper. And for the, you know, for others, surface is what has been acceptable and what has been, you know, the the healthy place to be, right? And that I think is one of the biggest pieces for this. To, for me, for white folks, is to just be able to sit with discomfort and it's okay. And the more that we do that collectively mm-hmm. and we see each other sitting in the discomfort, stumbling, fucking up, mm-hmm. you know, like um, that's when we can move through that threshold, right? Go to the next place and then go, okay, that was hard. And this next one's going to be hard too. But we know that we can do it. We can move through it. We can sit with it. Because if not, I think it's extremely disrespectful. <laughs> you know? Well said. Well said. Yeah, I think that, um, um, you know, one of the things I'd like to, the whiteness is a, is a brand that was created, um, um, you know, into law as a legal construct out of the, in the Jamestown colony. Um, and that brand is like a whiteboard, mm. right? Um, you know, you can take a pen and you can you can you can skim across the surface of that whiteboard, and you can overlay all kinds of things on top of that whiteboard. But there's no depth to it, and so and so whiteness just keeps us swimming across the surface, right? And just uh, and and you can you can put all kinds of uh, shapes and forms into whiteness, um, but it's only surface deep. And, um, and as long as we remain there, as long as we remain in these, in these traits of whiteness, um, we're, we're stuck. And I, I've, um, I've, I've come to um, realize and understand that um, this has been a process, right? You know, like when Jerry first started using the word in the house, white, whiteness and white supremacy, my quills would go up. I feel like, yo, like that's why, why are you pointing that into my direction? You know, um, especially the, the idea of white supremacy and um, 
you know, um, uh, because even though I didn't necessarily identify with whiteness, there was still something inside of me that was like, you're talking about me. And, um, and what I've come to, you know, the journey that I'm on at this point, what I've come to kind of realize and come to is that um, this is the system we're swimming in. We are swimming in the system of white supremacy. You can call it a lot of things. You can call it white supremacy. You can call it colonized civilization. Um, uh, but this is this is the system that we're swimming in. And this is what's harmful to all of us, uh, as you said, Aaron, right? This is this is what's harm harming all of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think what's I think what's so important to remember, like within the context of like talking about, you know, um, this within the context of ancestral healing work, ancestral remembrance work, ancestral work is that um, is that yes, it's it's part of it is developing our capacity, right, to feel, to hold all of these complexities, and also develop for a lot of us it's developing our capacity to receive love and care from our ancestors too yeah and support from our ancestors and again because it can be so easy it can be so easy to fall into that trap of individualism you know um and it's all up to me you know or i'm gonna be like the best white person and i'm gonna you know read all the books and do all the things you know whatever and it's like And to to hold, and when talking about building capacity, I say that in the context of like holding that both and, Mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, yes, yes to everything. And also like our ancestors have such deep medicine to offer us, have such deep wisdom, have such deep guidance, you know? And it can be hard to receive that. It can be really, really easy once you start waking up to these systems and how horrific they are and the way that you, me as a white person, I've contributed to them, how my ancestors have contributed to them, it'd be really easy to hate yourself. Mm-hmm. Really, really easy to hate yourself, to hate your ancestors, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and it's understandable, like, right? It's like, un- like all these things that we're talking about and Jerry, what you're speaking to of like this resist or like Ankara with like the numbness, like it's really understandable, right? Because we don't live in a world where we're taught how to navigate this, mm-hmm. right? How to That's hold right. this. And so, right. so, so again, I just want to bring that in of our also building our capacity to receive love and care and support, building our capacity to build connection, building our capacity to build deeper relationships with people, with place, right? With the land, with the trees, with our ancestors, you know, um, because it's always it's always that um, it's always that that both that both and within, yes, this, within this work non-binary non-linear exactly yeah yeah I think just another part of that loneliness that can be so mm-hmm. deep um, is the narrative that white folks have um, been living for a while where like your aunt, like what ancestors, Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like that you don't even have any ancestors. Like, who are those people? Like, you know, what are you? I'm American. Like, it's just like having, not understanding that we are them. Like (laughs) literally them making us is us. And that, you know, I think of like plant cuttings or plants that are trees mm-hmm. that are cuttings of cuttings of cuttings and that they're continuations of those mother plants. And that that's what we are too, right? Like in some way that we're just the constant um, proof that these other folks existed and lived and dreamt and ate and, you know, did all the things um and also the proof that they did really horrific things Mm -hmm. and so um that's another thing that i think is like we all understand this but i think that this is a narrative that's starting to hopefully wake up what we're we're waking up from is that narrative that what folks did didn't doesn't affect us Mm -hmm. what our ancestors did we're not you know it's not our fault but we're responsible 
Yes. You know? And that's that like kind of slippery place that I've had com many conversations with white folks where they're like, I'm not responsible. That's not me. I don't care. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't do it. I, I didn't own slaves. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't perpetuate these atrocities. What, what, um, what our ancestors have provided us, um, and we've, um, you know, we haven't been smacked by a meteor yet, so civilization hasn't been pushed back to, you know, to, to, um, to some record period where we, we can't see our own history. Um, we can see far enough back in this history at this point that, that our ancestors have provided us a look at what not to do. Mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, um, war prior to World War One was propagated with um, arrows, swords, spears, and and some guns and horses. And then World War One comes along, and it uh, and and it and it really shows the horror of war. Uh, you know, the, um, and World War Two comes along, and it's you know it, it, we did it again. Um, you know, and and oh, we're going to learn that lesson. And then we we get all these nuclear weapons and. And we're just moving in this direction that seems like an inevitability, but there is another, another inevitability. And that inevitability is to look backwards and say, we need to learn from these mistakes because that road's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and so our, our ancestors have provided us this, uh, um, you know, those atrocities that, that, that they, that they were participated in, that they were involved in, they give us, they give us um, a roadmap of what not to do as well. Yes. Um, do either of you um, want to talk about um, ancestors and epigenetics? Do you feel comfortable talking about that? I love talking about that. If <clears throat> Aaron, do you? Yeah, you start us off. Though. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, have always felt it, like always felt what we call epigenetics. Um, and then I learned, I don't know how many years ago, I mean, it hasn't been that long that this has been in conversation. It's been less than 10 years, probably, mm -hmm. you know, around 10 years. I, it started really being on my radar, maybe when the, when the, when the genome was, or when the human genome was sequenced. Started so back in the late attention. 90s. Yeah, in the night, late 90s, I started kind of paying attention to this. Um, but then it was like around the last 10 years or about 10 years ago that I started diving into more about what epigenetics is. And, and um, I'm going to give you just my theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I'm not an epigeneticist. Um, but I think that it's always um, I've been told my whole life, like animal instinct, these animals know what to do mm -hmm. without being taught because it's their animal instinct. Look at that. My mom would be like, look, you know, the dog knows what to do. Like we had this shepherd dog, this cute, my most amazing dog growing up, Cappy. My parents had chickens. This was in New Mexico. And my dad would say, now watch, watch Cappy. And he would go and round up the chickens. <laughs> And my mom was like, this is amazing. You know, how does he know this? And it was like Cappy knew because he's a shepherd dog. Yeah. And his ancestors did that. Mm -hmm. yep. He didn't grow up. You know, he grew up, he was born in, you know, New Mexico. But he knew that. So we, it's very easy for us to always, like, see this at the other part of it and not look at it within ourselves. So I feel like it's like um, the pieces that our ancestors left behind in our bodies that activate at some point, you know, like genes activate at different times in our lives and some genes don't activate. We can be carrying genes that don't activate. This is why siblings can be so different. This is why family members all, you know, we, we can be so different if we're, you know, blood related. Um, and then also there's like the environmental uh, or environment that we're raised in that is a huge part of who we are as well. It's both. Um, but there's these parts of us that our grandparents, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, um, we, we have these parts in our bodies and our, our, um, our genes can, like I said, express at different times. And that gives us what I think an ability to tap into their knowing, Yes. Their, their traumas mm -hmm. um 
and I have felt this in my body in lots of different ways. And I've now spoken with people and seen examples of this happening with other folks. So epigenetics is like this. Um, yeah, that's, I guess, a, a way that I could describe that is like what we're still carrying um, of our ancestors in our bodies. That, yes. Would that be similar? I mean, it sounds like so the Institute of Heart Math talks about the uh, different um, they did an intuition research. So they had um, energetic sensitivity, non-local intuition, and implicit knowledge. And the implicit knowledge sounds like that is something that is passed down through us, through our ancestors. So there's sometimes, you know, like, like the dog. It's like dog's ancestors knew this is what you're supposed to do. I feel that, you know, Aaron and Kara, what we're doing right now, right? It's like our ancestors know what we're supposed to do. I don't know if you all feel this way, but when I'm in this kind of spaces, I feel like this is my people. Mm. This is where I belong. Mm. I don't feel that yeah. anywhere else, right? It's like, and then we have to, we've got to question that energy that we're feeling. What is that? Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Erin, what do you think of genetics? Well, what's coming up for me is just about remembrance like so much of this work is it just about remembering right it's not necessarily about like learning new things it's about um remembering what's always been there and what the story that comes that comes to um that comes up for me is my relationship with water mm. like from a very 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 i when i was a child we would go to Ocean City, New Jersey every summer. And I would literally, and I'm not exaggerating, I would literally spend hours in the ocean just by myself, just hours playing, communing, you know, just being with the ocean. And I have always, always had a deep, deep, deep relationship with water, right? A deep relationship with the, with the ocean, but also rivers and lakes and um, bat, taking baths, you know, shower, you know, like water and I, like we go deep, right? So this is, this is just inherent into who I am. But until I started to, um, until I started these deeper inquiries, or when I started these deeper inquiries and started to learn more about my Celtic, Irish and Scottish ancestors, and the fact that I come from island people who were literally surrounded by the ocean, who had sacred, sacred wells mm -hmm. all over, the relationship with water being so deep of the understanding that the water is the ancestral realm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, I've known this my whole life, but I didn't know, right? It has been with me, this wisdom and this medicine has been inherent within me for my entire life. And when I could start to contextualize it, I understood that it wasn't just me, that this yes. is not a unique experience to me, that this is generational, that goes back thousands of years of wisdom, of knowing, Ge a generational relationship with the ocean. Yes. When I was in Scotland a few years ago, I went swimming in the North Atlantic, which is very cold. <laughs> I was going to say, that must have been really cold. <laughs> it is very cold. It is not the same temperature as the Atlantic, <laughs> the East Coast. Um, but it was like, it, it was just, it, again, this like activation of knowing, you know, of remembering, of remembering. That is, that's beautiful. What, Kara, what's your connection? Your, do you have connection to water, to the mountains? What's Me? Yeah. Oh, um, oh yeah. I, I'm <laughs> so deeply connected with all the elements. Um, I grew up, you know, I grew up in, in Santa Barbara. So I grew up with the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. like big part of um you know that's a big part of that town big part of my growing up um and i you know i'm half mediterranean mm -hmm. so really salty ocean is very much part of uh 
how I connect with my ancestors for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, water, I, I love what you just said, Erin, um, that, that water is the ancestral realm, because like, I really feel that. Um, and I feel like water is our connector is our one of our ancestor connectors really, really deeply, because all of our ancestors, I say this all the time, like, all of our ancestors prayed on the water that we're still in communication with now. So we receive their prayers continuously and then we yep. can pray into the water and give that back we can pray into the water when we take a sip of water and receive those prayers ourselves that's a big practice for me is like the first glass of water that i have every morning i i speak to mm. i try to speak to all the water that i receive in my body right. or i think at least i think you know can't always do it in public but like think these things as i receive them because water molecules uh, bind to whatever energy they come in contact with. We know that one drop of something can affect a whole pool of water. So it's, it's that to me, that binding of energy is so amazing and that we're constantly receiving it. And it's, and all the water has gone through all the people who have ever lived, mm -hmm. all the animals, mm -hmm. everyone that's ever lived. And it's made its way through this entire planet continuously going through that cycle and so mm -hmm. that is yeah i mean water i i constantly feel like that's a way that i communicate with my ancestors is i speak to the water put that water on my altar and i know that they're receiving it and i know that then i'm drinking their prayers too yeah it's um, such a water so sacred right and then it's like if we think about you know just a desecration of sacred lands that is happening right mm -hmm. now Yes. On Oahu, we're dealing with the Red Hill, with the military. And, you know, I mean, Oahu is where I'm from. That's yeah. my people, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, and then we think about the Dakotas and all mm -hmm. of the, you know, it's like what's happening and how that I feel is when we understand that, that is why it is so important for us to stand together, right? Mm -hmm. Linking arms and being able to be like, protect our water. Yeah. And, you know, this makes me think about how do we dream a different world? How do we step into our dreams that our ancestors is giving us these messages and move that dream into reality? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you, either of you familiar with um, Beta Austin's work? I don't know. Um, I'll share the website with you. Um, uh, she um, she does work with um, with communicating with water and um, is, and firmly believes that water has a consciousness and not only does water have a consciousness but because we're you know 90 plus percent water that consciousness is also within us and um, and that um, uh, she, she there's some really incredible videos on her website um, similar to that Mikachu um, Japanese um, mm -hmm. physicist who was using words on water yeah. and then looking how the words crystallized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's using images on water and the image and water is mimicking um, it, as it freezes. It's mimicking the, the um, it's communicating back. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, for me, I grew up in the Sierra Nevada as I, I grew up in Sonora and, um, um, and that's where my people my longest lineage of, of people um, that I can connect to reside um, five generations there. And, and so uh, rivers, um, you know, res rivers and reservoirs, uh, I would tend to be a big part of who I've been as a person. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try and connect everything we've said and, and drop it back into dreaming. Um, I think that part of dreaming something different for ourselves is going to have to be, um, it's going to have to be learning to see ourselves differently. Um, instead of seeing ourselves as these deconstructed, um, um, you know, critical thinking, um, Newtonian methodology kind of beings, um, we're going to have to understand what consciousness is, and we're going to have to begin to, and I think we are. I think, I think our science is leaning this way. I think the idea behind epigenetics is leaning this way. We used to call it junk DNA. And, and we've begun to evolve out of that in, in realizing this isn't junk DNA at all. 
Um, in fact, it's probably, you know, it can be a lot of different things. It can be ancestral DNA. Um, and also the, what HeartMath is doing with the idea of biofields and, and understanding that, that, um, that, you know, not only are we transmitters, but we're receivers and the electromagnetic field around us that's touching everybody else's electromagnetic field is communicating. In that, um, you know, one of the things that, that physics is resisting is, um, is it's resisting um, the idea of moving back to this idea that space is not empty, but full. Space is, um, space is full of not only potential, but it's full of energy, more energy in a cube of space than there is all the matter thrown into that cube of space combined. There's a physicist, um, Nassim Haramine, who um, does uh, um, a, a lot of research on, on the idea that space is what connects us all um, from, the, from the, the atoms in our body all the way out to the, you know, to the space in between us and planets. Um, I think that these ideas, I believe that these ideas um, as they begin to evolve and as we begin to talk about them, understand them and learn about them, um, these are the new understandings of who we are. So um, um, with your understanding of these, of, of, of whatever, you know, from any of these ideas that we've discussed and, and others that, you, that you're holding, what is the dream? What is the dream that we can lean into as, as a species? Um, what that that um, uh, that we're struggling so hard to try and and manifest. Well, I'm reminded um, of something our mutual friend Angela Angel uh, speaks about, and um, she's a brilliant herbalist and just amazing human being. Um, and she talks about how the future, the future ancestors are calling us forward. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think what's really important to remember when we, within ancestral work that it's not just about looking backward, uh -huh. that linear time is not real. <laughs> yeah. It does not exist. And that there are future ancestors who are, who are, who are calling us forward right? That it's not just up to us to, to dream things into being. I mean, we're a part, right. We're participants. We contributed to it, but there is a bigger picture here. Right. And I'm also reminded of Adrian Marie Brown's work and mm -hmm. talking about science fiction and, um, working with science fiction to really expand, right. Um, what's possible right an understanding of what's possible and that we need to like right like really kind of deconstruct um deconstruct right all of these systems and like and really dream into being what's possible outside of them and um and trust that it's possible <laughs> mm -hmm. right and like and she just does such a brilliant job job i think it was an emergent strategy that like these systems were created yeah Right. And I think it was Ursula Le Guin who talks, oh, I don't remember the quote, so I'm not going to say it, but talks about like that at one point, right, monarchy in Europe, monarchy, it felt like people believed monarchy was going to be forever, that that system was going to be forever. Right. I'm sure feudalism too. Right. That this is just how it is and we have to deal with it. Amidst that, there were plenty of people who were uprising against that system. I think it's always remember important to remember that we come from that legacy too of people who are fighting against these systems of oppression and harm. Um, but to know that, I think before we can even dream, we need to believe that it's possible. Yes. You know, and really hold that possibility. And I think that has been one of the blessings of COVID, hmm. of really showing us for those of us with the most historical power and privilege who, who, who these systems have been like, you know, working for, right? Mm -hmm. Quote unquote, I'm, I'm doing air quotes because um, <laughs> we're, we're on a podcast. Um, working for, to be like, oh, capitalism actually doesn't work, right? Like, oh, our incarceral state 
doesn't work, right? Starting to really question on this collective level, right? These systems that meant too many people have taken for granted as just like, this is just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Well said. I'm gonna say one last thing and then I'm gonna pass it to you, Cara. Go for it. Okay. Um, I teach every year, I teach a six month um, class called Ancestral Stories, where every month we um, explore particular stories. And our last, our second to last time together, we do stories of the future. Mm -hmm. And we take time to collectively dream together. Yeah. And to take the time I think it's important, right, with this question to take the time to have these conversations, to believe that it's possible and to do it together, right? And to really feel into what's possible, but also like, why are we, why do we keep showing up for the work, mm -hmm. right? To remind us because it's hard, right? As a white person, it would be so easy for me to just like, mm, no, I don't want to do this work anymore. I'm just going to like, get a job and I'll be safe, relatively safe. I'll be fine for the rest of my life, yes. right? And so why are, we, why are we committing to this work again and again, right? And when we can dream for the future, like that can help, right? Remember, right? And center us back into why are we, why are we doing this? And I think the ancestral work can help us see the bigger picture, right? The generational picture that this goes so much beyond our lifetimes. Yeah. Okay, done. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. That's, my, <laughs> that's definitely my dream. Um, <clears throat> I think that, whew, um, what you said, Jerry, earlier on about the mind-body connection not being um, acknowledged a lot, I think this is a, a, a piece of it to, for me is that the deeper, like that it's simple and that the deeper that we understand that our mind and our body are connected, that we have two brains, right? Our gut and our, the one in our head mm -hmm. and that all of our body systems are connected. They're not separate either. And that those body systems are connected with the water and connected with the air, the wind, mm -hmm. connected with the fire. I didn't even talk about fire, but that's a big, big thing for me. And the mountains and the volcanoes mm -hmm. and that, and the plants and that all of it is connected, that we are really all connected and tapping into that place that no matter where we were, no matter where our ancestors were on this planet, they all at some point knew and were in communication with those. The more we return to that simplicity, I think that's mm -hmm. the ticket for me, you know, just to simplify it because it's not, there's so much, but if I really simplify it into my dream of, uh, of that, we can, can just know that it's okay to be simple in that way mm -hmm. that we don't mm -hmm. have to complicate to feel important <laughs> you know, or to feel valid that lying on the earth um, and breathing is is um, is collective healing yes. Yes. you know that just like really just just deepening into to that space between Jeremy, like what you're talking about, like the, the, um, the Romans, okay, going on a little tangent, the Romans mother, <laughs> Magna Mater, this is what matter is named after mm. the, the black mountain, Cibele, her temple is now where, um, the Vatican is. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay? She's deep. <laughs> She's important. She's where we, you know, Magna Mata, or like the, the Black Mountain. She's the Black Mountain, which is, what is now Turkey. Mm -hmm. And like remembering like that that is who we are. Mm. I love that. Have you both heard of uh, Sherry Mitchell? So Sherry Mitchell is an indigenous scholar and um, she Her talks- Her sitting right behind you. Right behind your shoulder right there. Oh, yeah, Sacred Instruction. It's called mm -hmm. Sacred Instruction. And um, 
she has done she's she's done a lot of amazing work so sacred instruction she says she calls you know the work that we're doing or how we're how I just feel this is when I hear the stories that we're all sharing it's um, Sherry Mitchell calls it sacred activism Mm -hmm. and she she talks about you know the space of inviting both native and non-native people to come to the table to discuss ways of healing the trauma of colonization that is shared by all of us. So when we're able to get back into our bodies and, and you know, it's like also when we get back into our bodies, sometimes in this decolonization process, you know, Erin, you were saying earlier that after listening and knowing and understanding and discovering what your ancestors have done, it's easy to hate yourself, mm-hmm. right? But then that whole thing about calling forward So Sherry Mitchell talks about how the sacred activism heals seven generations, the Mm -hmm. opportunity to look back three generations, right? Knowing who we are right now and looking forward and feeling that call of future ancestors starts with us. Mm -hmm. So you have three forward, three back and yourself. And that's seven Mm -hmm. generations Mm -hmm. because of this work and inviting the spirit of compassion and empathy into our conversation I think that's what that's kind of what my dream is is being able Mm -hmm. to engage currently in these uncomfortable conversations and be willing to pivot and face the discomfort with the intent to heal and Mm -hmm. so that's my dreaming (laughs) Mm-hmm. what's your dreaming Jeremy I think uh, uh, that same physicist did an experiment um, 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 where they mapped the mass of um, all matter that they could you know that they that they could in the in the in the universe right so and they put it on a they put it on um, it's just a line graph and so up here you know you've got um, star systems and stars like Arcturus you know these massive stars and 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 it, you know and, and it goes in galaxies and it goes down and then down here you've got um you know you've got uh blood you know blood cells and molecules and atoms and and um and you've got electrons and, and protons and quarks well as they mapped that mass out what sat right in the middle of that of that of that was um everything on the biological scale humans whales lions um, birds, right? And um, and I think one of the things that's that's interesting about that, just like Sherry Mitchell, Mitchell's con, um, you know uh, concept, right? Like I sit in the middle of of this moment in time of uh, of generation, right? Um, you know, um, those that came uh, before are still with me, and those that are um, come after are with me as well. Um, I just happen to be the one that's in um, sitting in the material at the moment, but that consciousness is all the same. And, um, and so the, the moment to um, follow that path of, you know, of um, uh, help me the, the, the path of uh, decolonization. Are you, uh, so are you talking the five phases of decolonization? Yeah. So yeah. you have rediscovery and recovery. Rediscovery and recovery. Morning. Um, morning, healing, dreaming, 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 commitment, and action. Yeah, you, that, that's it. <laughs> right? That path, that moment to commit to that path, that moment to dream, that moment to commit, that moment to take action rests here. It rests right here. And um, and I, it is my sincere, not just hope, but it is also my belief that... Um, we're having these conversations not because they're just going to be meaningless conversations that are going to be swallowed up by by the void of of capitalism and and white supremacy we're having these conversations because they're echoing into the void and they're being called back exactly exactly we are um it's just about one o'clock and so i wanted to give both um cara and Aaron, the opportunity to let us know what's what's happening in the new year and how can people 
get a hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'll start. I, um, I have a website. People can see it's Chimaruta Remedies. That's my business name. Um, and it's chimarutaremedies.com. That's also my Instagram handle. So you can sign up for my um, quarterly newsletter through my website. Every season I put out a newsletter um, and then I work one-on-one -on -one with folks um, doing ancestral healing and also as a herbalist. Um, and they are different, but they can also look very similar. Um, I do things really um, individually based, you know, it's all for what folks are looking for, deepening into and needing help guiding, you know, me guiding them through. I also teach classes. Um, I don't have anything lined up right now as far as classes in the new year, kind of taking a break from teaching. I was teaching a lot this the last two years on Zoom, a lot. <laughs> and um, so I'm just taking a breath from that, but I will be doing that again. And um, yeah, so you can sign up for my newsletter and go to my website and I will be offering things in the new year for sure that's great and then we'll put it on to our website as well too so people could um you know find you all how about you Erin how could people find you sure so um people can find me on my website it's my name Erin Caitlin Sweeney.com um same for Instagram Erin Caitlin Sweeney Caitlin with a c and um I, I have openings um, for new clients. I work, I work with folks on a six month arc. Um, so I have openings for the beginning of the year. And um, I also have newsletter that, I don't know, sometimes it's once a month, sometimes it's once a season. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and then I am gonna have offer the ancestral stories class um, registration for that will be open starting in February and that'll be um March through um meeting once a month March through September so that's coming up in the spring that is awesome and Jeremy is doing a lot of um well you could talk about it I don't want to talk for you <laughs> oh um uh, I'm yeah so through our our um consulting company co3 consulting we're offering uh dismantling whiteness uh, uh, cohort starting January 25th. Um, and it'll go, um, it'll go, um, there's three sessions and, um, and it is, a uh, it's a path to personal decolonization or healing through personal decolonization. Um, and, um, and then if, uh, if anybody wants to, um, check out the work that, that we're doing further. They can go to co3consulting.net, co number three consulting.net, and you will see um, some of our services. Uh, if you want to dig into some of the audio material that, that, uh, that we're producing, plowline.com, P L O W L I N.com, you'll see both this podcast as well as Jerry's podcast, uh, which is called Mix Plate Podcast. And she's um, pretty brilliant at one-on-one -on -one conversation with individuals. And um, I think uh, I think you guys have both I've, been... Yes, I've invited both Kara yeah. and Erin to be part of it, which is going to yeah. be amazing. And, you know, as, as both of you are talking about the work that you're doing and the work that Jeremy's doing, I can just see this beautiful intersection of, you know, it's like when individuals, and this is just based off of my experience looking in on how people of European descent is, is, is going through all of this. And it's interesting to kind of like be a fly on the wall. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's like a, I, I'm seeing that as, as Jeremy talks about dismantling whiteness, there is this, um, there is a somatic response in individuals where they don't know where to go after that, right? They're like, okay, so I dismantle my whiteness, now what? Yeah. That's where I see the work of ancestral healing that right. comes in to where they can reconnect. So it's like, you know, <clears throat> taking individuals down this path and having the tools to be able to share and grow and transform in the process 
of it all. And, you know, it's like, this is definitely not the kind of work that we do together, but we do in community and being able to, you know, get to know the two of you and the work that you're doing and the magic that you're making and your connection to ancestral knowledge and healing. Ooh, I'm really excited. <laughs> I, am. <laughs> I am. I'm really excited. I, I am. I am honored. I am so honored that we, you know, we met this way and, you know, it's like we connected this way. It, it, it just feels natural again, right? It's like, listening to the ancestors coming i i have i always have this visual jeremy's like oh my god you're always like thinking like these bubbles in my head i feel like the ancestors are kind of like looking at each other and like hey so um your granddaughter's meeting my granddaughter today <laughs> <laughs> and they're gonna like finally they got to meet each other right that's that's kind of like what i feel is like they're just having a conversation and it's just trickling down through us and we were meant to be here and our paths were crossed the way they were because it was meant it was just meant to be and so yes i want to thank you all for being here and um i guess we'll close with letting everyone know that you know you've been listening to the plowline podcast and that we are going to be posting this soon please subscribe to uh, either Plowline or Mixed Plate Podcast on any of your um, favorite podcasts. What do you call it, Jeremy? Podcasts. Platforms. Platforms, yes. So <laughs> I am Jer uh, Dr. Jerry Valarosa Tanel, the host of the Mixed Plate Podcast and the principal co consultant of Co3 Consulting, co-creating cohesive uh, communities. So uh, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Jerry Balarosa Tanel. And this is where supporters and allies can partner through financial gifts to assist in efforts to co-creating a better world through the evolution of aloha and the uh, dialogue of engaging in dialogue towards healing. So thank you so much. Until next time, ahui ho, please take care of yourselves and each other and happy holidays. Jeremy? Um, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. It was really an honor, um, an honor to be invited here and be in conversation with y'all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank I'm you. so happy to know you and I'm so grateful to our ancestors. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, stop. <laughs>